We all tend to get a little nostalgic around these holiday times leading up toward Christmas. And I found myself thinking about some Christmas memories, one that had conveniently slipped my mind until just recently. And it was during my college years and I was driving up with my parents to go visit my grandmother in North Louisiana to see other family that were around that area of the state. And we arrived on the morning of Christmas Eve and immediately went into all of the preparations over the course of the day to make sure that our dinner, the big priority, was just right. And so by nighttime, we found ourselves looking at a huge piping hot turkey and the asparagus casserole was just finished with bubbling cheese on the top. Uh, the rolls and the uh, dressing were still raw, but they were ready to be popped in the oven. And the coconut cake was freshly frosted with flakes just perfectly placed on the top of that dessert. And, you know, something unimaginable and inconvenient happened. It wasn't that we got socks or underwear in the gifts that we were about to unwrap. It wasn't that Santa's sleigh even broke down so that we would be empty handed the next morning. No, it was that the electricity went out. And you know, if you're in a small town like Homer, where my Mima was from, she had lived there for decades by that point, when the electricity goes out, there is no light inside your house, there is no light outside of your house, all the street lights are off. And if you think that an electrical truck is gonna come that night on a holiday weekend, you can think again. You're probably gonna be waiting for days. And so that's what happened to us. We found ourselves tripping around each other in a house that we should have been able to navigate like the back of our hand. And we found ourselves looking for a flashlight that for all South Louisianans with a hurricane bag at the ready and those Tupperwares of emergency kits for storms uh, available at any time to open up with everything we could possibly need. We could only find a taper candle from her living room and my mom's cigarette lighter. And so we lit it up and put it right in the center of that dinner table, decided to laugh at the situation because we really had no other choice. And then we tried to salvage what we could of this dinner that we were so lovingly cooking together. We put the turkey in the middle of the table and uh, took out some condiments from the refrigerator and we had turkey sandwiches with stale white bunny bread and uh, a random asparagus casserole and then a cranberry sauce that we opened the can and pulled that little gelatinous thing with ridges and put it on a really pretty plate sliced. And so we found ourselves just around this table and at first it was awkward and then it turned into something different where we had conversations and told stories in a way that uh, revealed something about our family that probably never would have occurred if the regular distractions of a normal holiday set of traditions would have been able uh, to be had. We found ourselves actually in a really intimate and beautiful place of being connected in a, in a unique way to each other. Still, you know, it is the Christmas that uh, it was a complete disaster. It was the cr Christmas that should not be named. It was the Christmas where everything went wrong. It is named to most people, but I would debate that. Maybe that was the Christmas where everything that happened was just right. And we had all that we needed. These were the days before uh, electricity apps could tell you exactly when the light would come back on. And, and these days we find ourselves, especially living in a city, most of us, that we have light in abundance and perhaps we take this resource for granted. We know how important light is uh, to Christmas, of course, uh, with our Christmas trees being lit up and decorated, with our houses being strung with lights, many of them all over, with the luminaries that we put on our sidewalks in schools and in neighborhoods, our businesses, our churches, our stores, all of them are donned with the signs of the season. 
and it's beautiful, but I wonder if uh, these lights uh, just continue to put us in a place where we do uh, just accept that they will be there always because we do have so much of it. You know, in times before electricity, most of us won't remember, but if you grew up on a farm or have family that do, do you may know that uh, dark and light before uh, the recent times where electricity was available to us, dark and light governed our lives. When uh, darkness fell and the sun was setting and the moon came, we really had uh, very little chance to do anything else. You couldn't navigate the dark outside and certainly inside very well, so you just ate and went to bed. And then the next morning as the sun rose and the cock crowed, it was a whole new opportunity uh, to have a fresh start and a productive and fruitful day. You know, those of you that have camps or uh, find them yourself in a deer blind somewhere, uh, deer stand, wherever you are, uh, you may find or, or know something of what it feels like to have the stars of old that generations before have experienced and enjoyed just wrapped around us in the horizon uh, where it's almost never ending, a, a completely infinite stretch of light to enjoy and behold. But that kind of starlight that lights and leads the way isn't there anymore for much of us. Since the earliest times, light was used to illumine and guide, like in a lighthouse. We find that uh, light ignites and warms like a fire. It catalyzes, it energizes, it starts, and it even burns. We think that's always bad, but there are ways that fire and, and light burn that, again, allow land to lie fallow and allow uh, productive fruit to emerge in new ways. These stories of light and darkness are also bookends in scripture, if you notice. Even at the very beginning in Genesis, God moved over the chaos and the dark face of the deep and said, let there be light. And it was light and it was called good. In Revelation 22, right at the end of another John's vision, in chapter 5, it says very simply that uh, the vision of the very end where Jesus is on the throne, there will be no more night for, and no more need for lamp or even for sun. For the Lord God will be our light, it says. This God who spoke and, uh, and gave the word said that there would be light is the same God uh, that became flesh and blood and dwelt among us. And this year has been filled with so many instances where we might wonder that this God, this Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that has been here every time and in all times and promises still to be, we have the audacity to ask the question and wonder where is God's light in this moment when things get hard? I find that the power of John's, John's words come as he reminds us of a reality in which we live that may not make us very comfortable. What John says in this prologue, this new and different way of telling the nativity story than the other gospel writers, as much as we wish that it would be different, he reveals to us again that light is not, in God's eyes, the absence of darkness. He says, what has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all the people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. This God who takes on our human flesh doesn't ignore the darkness. Uh, it, God doesn't sweep it away, even though I'm sure God would have the power to do that. But even in the midst of that darkness, God decides that the most powerful thing to do is to shine through and in the midst of it. God does this in every season and in every life, if you notice, in the hardest times. For us, if we look back, we can each in some ways point to the ways where God's light was shining, even in the smallest of forms. 
God doesn't turn the world over to someone else uh, sometimes and need a break. God is forever with us as the psalmist writes a spiritual song that reminds us of that reality even as we are being knitted in the flesh of our mother's womb. It says darkness is not ever dark to God. Even the night shines and is as bright as the day, Psalm 139 says. So you know, I know, we have been in a year of divisions this year of 2020, and the days of this year, thankfully, are dwindling. But the black and white kind of stark uh, separation that we have been experiencing in this time is one that uh, has made love hard to find. And the love that we wish was collectively present in us as a nation, as a church, as even families, uh, maybe the opposite of that love that we have been experiencing is not necessarily hate, even though that has been on display in overabundance, uh, to be sure. But I'm finding perhaps a growing reality of apathy that continues to exist without and within. And that is a concern all on its own. During this pandemic, you and I have watched, whether we have allowed our hearts to grieve this or not, we have watched that on the whole, the richer among us have gotten richer and the poorer have gotten poorer and are struggling more. Some of you probably saw this week the report of statistics around mental illness and anxiety that there are very specific discernible communities like women uh, that are experiencing such deep mental illness in exponential rates over these past 10 months. We also saw again with the growing numbers, 3,000 every day, uh, most days, of those dying of COVID-19, that it is people of color over those of Anglo descent like myself that will die from this virus. And again, we have uh, the audacity at times uh, to wonder and ask, where is God in all of this? But instead, the question that it begs for us as Christians is really, why is this happening? Why? These are the shadows and the chasms that coexist, and they have coexisted for generations in various forms, but have been conveniently hidden among us for uh, certain ones of us gain. And God's sure and constant presence has been among us in the midst of these chasms, but I'm finding even now, especially now, that we are separated and distanced in body for so long. It's only a matter of time where our hearts will separate from those around us too. Uh, you know, sheltering in my home, even in these two weeks, maybe it's just that I'm extremely extroverted and love people. My heart has been just languishing and hoping for human connection and human touch, the shake of a hand, the holding of a hand in prayer, the pat on a back that I can give to someone as a point of affirmation and encouragement. We have those things happen all the time and we often don't notice how much uh, they provide power and a sense that we are not alone. I have watched my own life and uh, most of us in some way with anxiety growing and compassion fatigue being a real thing uh, that we at times often now lean back for survival. There's only so much we can take, only so much we can do. And we lean back into those convenient tribes that make us feel comfortable, but don't allow us to really live as the light as God has called us to live while we're hunkering down, just waiting for the day or the year uh, where this storm we are experiencing collectively will be over. Some of us, I would suggest all of us at some points are on autopilot in our community. And especially with those that are just crying out for help, needing us most. I don't want you to hear these words that I am saying first to myself 
as a condemnation, but instead as a call. For if we are made in the image of God, then we are like the light that John talks about that breaks into human existence. If you and I watch the fire of a candle burn, you know that this light, it often, if not always, even the smallest flame, it never really stands still. Adam Hamilton, in a study uh, around incarnation, we've been walking through this over the past four weeks, he makes the claim, as we talk about us being children of the light, that in our world, he says, you and I are either bringing darkness or we're bringing light. That uh, by our words and deeds, you bring love and joy and hope to others or you take it away. You bless and you build up or you tear down and you hurt. That life is either about you or about living truly for others. And, you know, I struggled with these words for days because I just said surely to myself, uh, I want to justify my discomfort saying that there has to be a gray area somewhere. But really, even though I wouldn't express this exactly as Adam said it, in one way or another, we do find ourselves stretching uh, and moving uh, slightly uh, in one direction or in another, either growing in the strength of our love or receding from it because it's just too hard. It's either reaching to warm more of what and whom is around us or shrinking to an ember of our former selves. In the incarnation, God pinpricked a hole in the floor of heaven and descended uh, to enter into a fallen world with a body that he knew would disappoint and fail him. The very word incarnate at its root means invested with or embodied in the flesh, in people, in that time 2,000 years ago and in you and in me today. We may not all be blood related, but we are adopted in the spirit of God. And so it explains why uh, when we talk about living in an incarnational way, it means that you and I uh, have to actually care about those around us. And in fact, we're called to be invested wherever we care. We are called, uh, in fact, if we're wanting to care for or minister to a neighborhood as a congregation, we need to live in it. We need to have a stake in it because we will care more about the decisions that are made and the things that happen to those that live right around us. This, this friends, is why the incarnation makes a difference. God is invested and has made a home in every body. And so it matters how we're treated or how we're trafficked or how we're used or abused or ignored, how we treat each body, each person is, well, everything. Parker Palmer talks about it uh, as God choosing to risk the incarnation, to not only shed light in a way that was skin deep and on the surface, but to also, uh, in reach in and penetrate into the very heart of human existence and every human life. It is both an external reality exposing the spiritual forces of wickedness that we are all complicit to and the ways too that our systems allow us to hide our responsibility to what we see and uh, to hide from the pain within. Uh, and it is also internal. As we know that there is so much pain with people around us underneath the surface, whether we choose to respond to it or not, it is an incarnation that matters and allows us uh, to come out of the shadows in the ways that we have been conveniently hiding. 
It is the risk of embodying our values and our beliefs as Christian people living the gospel. Jonathan Wilson Hargrove talked about living incarnationally this way. It's to live our days in such a way that our lives literally would not make sense to people looking at us if the gospel, if the good news of God, uh, if the good news of Emmanuel was not true. This is uh, our, our belief that whatever part of us that needs to come out of hiding, whatever part of us that needs to be more courageous or come out of the shadows, whatever part needs tending, that the unconditional love of God, that God promises to provide for us uh, is there so that we can reveal those parts of ourselves and bring it to the light so we can serve and lead in, in the name of God differently. Jesus is God's revealing. Jesus is God's self-disclosure in a small baby, in a vulnerable, flickering flame. God invites us to walk in the light of God's love, to show who we are and to discover what it means to be God's once again. Barbara Brown Taylor speaks to this reality in her book, Learning to Walk in the Dark. She says, when I entered the cave, hoping for a glimpse of celestial brightness, it never occurred to me that it might be so small. But there it is, not much bigger than a mustard seed. While I'm looking for something large or bright or unmistakably holy, God slips instead something small, dark, and apparently negligible in my pocket. How many other treasures have I walked right by because they didn't meet my own standards? At least one of the day's lessons is about learning to let go of my bright ideas about God so that my eyes are opened to the God who is. You are the light of the world, friends. God revealed God's self, in, not in a book, but in a person, as Adam Hamilton says, and we are God's plan to help that light spread. So you and I are the light of the world. A town built on a hill can't be hidden. Neither people uh, light under a lamp, put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everything and everyone. One small candle. The darkness does not overcome it. But you don't know really where the light begins and the darkness ends. But we know that when the light is present, that the darkness is forever impacted and changed. Each time the light grows, it extends just a little bit farther and the darkness recedes and the kingdom of God inevitably expands. You know that this light even the smallest flame warms and wakes us up as it never really stands still when it burns. It is either growing in strength of love or receding. It is either reaching to warm more of the people and what is all around it or shrinking to an ember. So where are you today? Christmas is coming. So will you risk showing up as fully yourself, as God created you and called you to be in the flesh, living the incarnation? In the name of God, the Word who dwelt among us. Amen. <laughs>